So oh, I guess I'll start. Are we doing this is all things together? Yes, I didn't put that on there. This is all things together. And we say this is all things, or you say all, I say things, and then we say together, together. Is that how, <laughs> <laughs> is that how it works? Whew, okay. All right, let's rev it up. Cue to music. This is all things together. together. Ooh, somebody suggested we do that. It turned out pretty good. I hope he likes it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Troy Lamberth. And I'm Melissa Lamberth. And we're so glad you could join us here on this episode number four. Okay, so March is Women's History Month, and we've been posting all month long on our social media about women in church history who boldly stood for Christ. And it's been actually really fun, encouraging, educational to let people know about the women God has used throughout church history to bring glory to God's name. Yes, so on this episode, we are continuing that discussion, and we are speaking with church history author Simonetta Carr. This is Simonetta Carr, and I've written many books on church history. And how about, can you do it in Italian? (laughs) (laughs) Si, mi chiamo Simonetta Carr. Ho scritto tanti libri sulla storia della della chiesa. That sounded much more tastier, thank you. (laughs) Yeah, we can't wait for you to meet Simonetta. She's a very sweet lady, and we enjoyed talking with her about everything from pizza to church history. But we also have something else very exciting on this episode, episode number four. That's right, kids. It's a brand new, as told by little podcast theater, Lady Jane's Last Stand. (laughs) Oh, Edward has died? Me the queen? I don't know. Is this even legal? And don't forget to listen to the end, and we'll explain how to win two of Simonetta's books, Church History and her book about Lady Jane Grey. And actually, Troy, I didn't tell you this, but I figured we could give away one of our props from our John Knox film, which is a newspaper all about Lady Jane Grey. Yes. Wouldn't that be fun? Yeah, and you you designed that. It it looks really good, and when you watch the John Knox movie, you'll see... It's in there, so you'll get a prop as well as the book. That's a, that's a collector's item. Oh, yeah. Yes. You'll want to frame that. <laughs> <laughs> so back to Simonetta Carr. Yes. Honestly, I love that we got the opportunity to interview her this month. She has written children's books about Lady Jane Grey, John Owen, Charles Spurgeon, Augustine of Hippo, Athanasius, John Calvin, John Newton, John Knox, John Bunyan, Jonathan Edwards, basically all the Johns. Okay, so she's written a lot of books. <laughs> yes. She's basically sharing the story of the way so many Christians stood for the gospel throughout church history. And what a testimony that is in and of itself. Yeah, absolutely. And when we sat down with her, being that she is from Italy, we had to actually ask her. What is your favorite Italian food? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm not going to be very original, but it's pizza. <laughs> <laughs> We and would it, agree. <laughs> yeah. Well, it could be because I can't cook it yet. Um, I, one of my sons actually gave us a pizza oven, so oh, I'm, nice. I'm, I'm working toward it, but I still can't make it as good as uh, you get it in an Italian restaurant. <laughs> well, Madeline? What are your favorite pizza toppings to put on your uh. pizza? <laughs> pizza toppings uh it depends actually if it's a really good pizza i even like it just plain with mozzarella and uh, Mm. just very very plain but it depends i like anchovies because i like salty food and sometimes i like like artichokes or um, things like that yeah Wow. Now, when I was younger, I feel like anchovies were still hanging out in some pizza parlors, but I just don't see that anymore. I know. A lot of people don't like them, but I really like salty foods, so (laughs) anchovies are good for me. (laughs) Well, our youngest has a question about a topping that is more controversial these days than (laughs) anchovies. Does pineapple belong on pizza? Mmm. I don't know. I guess um, maybe historically not. 
<laughs> I don't. It doesn't belong to my pizza. <laughs> that, that was a very charitable answer. Yes, I was going to say, that's a very gracious answer. <laughs> it doesn't go with anchovies. Though. It doesn't go with anchovies. <laughs> well, and it's a very interesting palate uh, uh, persuasion there. Some like saltier, some right. like sweeter. Uh, and I, I'm going to confess here, I actually really do enjoy pineapple on pizza. You do? Okay. But blended with pepperoni. Pepperoni and, oh, and uh, pineapple. Okay. Well, it has, okay. to have, it has to have a source of salt. It's, it's a salty and the sweet right. on one thing. Yeah. That's why mm -hmm. I like barbecue chicken pizza because the barbecue sauce is sweet on it. Oh. Yeah. It's just like pepperoni. <laughs> Owen, what about you? Pineapple pepperoni. Because <laughs> it's good. <laughs> there we go, because it's good. <laughs> yeah, right. If <laughs> it's good, it's good. <laughs> All right. Well, kids, thanks for joining us. You're welcome. Those are our kids chatting with Simonetta. Uh, and we know that Italy is known for its pizza. I actually have only been in Italy once and was able to eat some pizza there. Uh, and Wait, you went to Italy? I did. Oh. did I, ever I told you that. 18 years. I went to the Cannes <laughs> Film Festival and my boss and my brother and I oh, that's borrowed right. the van <laughs> and we drove about an hour and a half to a little town on the border called San Remo and we found a little pizzeria that was open late and sorry Domino's and Pizza Hut, it was nothing like what they <laughs> offer. <laughs> but it was really good and it was an awesome memory. So now we know that Italy is known for pizza but it's also known as a sort of mecca for Roman Catholics. It was interesting to hear some of his background and experience with this. Well, I was born in Italy, as you said, um, in a Roman Catholic family, of course. Actually, my father uh, was a friar, a Dominican friar before he got married. So, <laughs> but um, but uh, he didn't really talk much about religion but anyway with the roman catholic church i didn't understand hardly anything about christianity i just i was terrorized of uh, being a sinner and not every roman catholic is like that i think in italy and, and american roman catholics are very different but in italy we grew up with it so most people are like nah. you know try to be good and the worst that can happen, I go to purgatory. It's like, they don't take it. Yeah, they, don't, they just don't stress over it. But I did. I was like Martin Luther. So I I would write down my sins because I was afraid to, to miss one in confession. And then I realized that I sinned so much. Like, you know, I was sinning even with my thoughts. I said, if I keep writing down, I won't do anything during the day except write down sins. So... <laughs> So, yeah, it was very different, my, my experience. I was a lot more intense <laughs> than most, most kids. And so, basically, Simonetta was living in fear, thinking that she had to be perfect in order to please God. But then the Lord was so kind to send a few short-term missionaries her way. They gave me something to read. They gave me the Gospel of John, actually, which was interesting because I... As a Roman Catholic, I had not written, read the Bible. Wow. <laughs> Interesting. Wow. Yeah. How sad. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, then I started to read. I read the Gospel of John, then I started to read some other books of the Bible and had lots of questions. Very few people could answer. And uh, so, anyway, just it's a long story. So, in a minute, I don't know what to say. <laughs> a but, minute or two? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, I, I guess, like, when I met these people a long time ago, they asked me to pray with them. And that was, like, like the asking Jesus into your heart, which I didn't even know what he meant. But it's right. one of those prayers that, you, you know, they don't explain very well. So, sure. uh, but, but it was a start. And then... It kind of uh, got me interested, and uh, and with time, I started to understand the um, the Protestant view, um, the way they read the Bible was was the way to read the Bible without any other additions from the church, the, the Roman Catholic Church. 
So that was the start for Simonetta. She continued to read the Bible and grow in her understanding of who Jesus was and that she was saved by faith alone in Christ and not of anything that she could do on her own. Jesus really took our sins on the cross, you know, in, in reality, not just uh, maybe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That's well, a good way to put it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, you know, so so and many. so and so many. Unfortunately, not just Roman Catholic, but in the big evangelical churches, it's uh, you know, mm -hmm. maybe, yeah. maybe he can <laughs> forgive right. you. He, he took somebody's sins on the cross, or <laughs> I'm not sure about mine. So right, so think, right. You know, but it's like no, you know, he, he really, really took our sins on the cross, and um, the sins of believers. You know, so it's like if you believe. That's your assurance right there. You know? And yeah, I, I don't amen. think you I don't think you have to spend so much time analyzing your faith. Your faith is a gift of God. So Simonetta met her husband in Italy. He happened to be an American traveling and teaching English as a second language. They got married. They traveled all around the world for years. They had eight kids. Yes, eight kids. Eight is enough. And then settled down in America, actually just south of us here in mm -hmm. San Diego. And uh, we're attending a couple of large churches there until the Lord used their kids to help them find a church that really taught the Bible. And it was so different. Because I took them to other vacation Bible schools, and they were like uh, veggie tales type of things. And then here, they actually read the Bible. <laughs> 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 and it was so different. And, and so I started to go there. And um, at first, uh, we didn't know how the kids would react because uh, it was so different. And the kids were with the parents in. Uh, they're doing a worship, but it was actually our kids who said, we like it better. And I, I know it doesn't happen to every parent. I, I heard parents that had a different reaction from their kids. But my kids said, one of my kids said, uh, I like it better here because I'm actually learning something. Now we're just going to take a pause real quick. We want to talk to our kids who are in our church service with us every Sunday. Kids, You've sat under preaching of sermons with us every Sunday since you can remember. There are some kids listening who may have never even experienced that. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience of being in church and listening to God's Word preached every single Sunday? Well, I'll admit, at first I would just draw and do whatever, look back at the clock, ask you for the time, just waiting to get out so I can hang out with my friends. But eventually I started listening to it and it was sort of just like a hammer going out of rock. At first it didn't really make a difference, but then eventually it just cracked open. And without the hammer being there, even when it wasn't making a difference, it wouldn't have done that. And how old were you when that happened? Um, probably around nine or ten, but I'd been listening before then, but less so. More just waiting to get out of the service. Now, as you guys are sitting there... You also are seeing people sing all around you. You're hearing prayers. You're hearing other scriptures read. What was that like for you? Mm, I think it's kind of just nice that we have some place that we can fellowship with everybody, like even like little kids and kids and adults and everybody. And it's nice. I like that. Not having to be in a class. And I don't know. It's kind of just wonderful. Everybody is singing to our creator. And that everybody who's praying, all those prayers get heard by God. What has your experience been like? Um, it is different than Sunday school. Not that I don't enjoy Sunday school. That is good because you're with peers of your own age. But being in this, like Owen said, it's different. There's a different feeling because the preacher is preaching to every single one of you. And it applies to every single one of you. And... Listening to the preacher, it opens your eyes to certain aspects of your life that you might have not known before. And so, like, it really does apply to your life if you're, like, in the service with everyone else. I will say, as their mother, um, it was hard when they were really young to sit with them and to train them. It's not easy to train them and to not be distracted. But now coming out and having 
two teenagers and a preteen coming out of that, I would not have it any other way. Uh, the Lord has really blessed um, so many conversations that we've had during the week uh, with our kids concerning the preaching of God's word and what they heard on Sunday. And that wouldn't have happened if they were not with us and if they were not listening and under the preaching of God's word. Yeah, it's so true. And when you look at the scriptures, you don't see the church divided amongst ages. The church has always been multi-generational and it has been a congregation of people from little to old and everything in between. And so if we trust that the Holy Spirit truly does minister through his word, then why would we not want our kids there to see and to hear um, that God's word is affecting others around them. I know our kids have said that times they've seen you or I with uh, you know, our eyes watering and <laughs> what's wrong. Well, you know, the Lord is speaking to me and, you know, they see that happening and, you know, the people sitting to the right of us, the people sitting in front of us, they see that, wow, there's a, a big group of people that actually take God serious and, and love Jesus and, and, and they're willing to stand and to sing and to worship um, out loud and they're willing to, to sit and to hear God minister through his word. Uh, that is powerful. That is beyond just you know trying to come down and condescend to a kid's heart. That is the dynamic of the church that the Holy Spirit often works through. And it's been encouraging to see you know our own kids um, interact with that and to, to be a part of that. And it's actually really been encouraging to see how much our kids, even younger than they are now, how much they understand mm -hmm. of what's being preached. Yeah. Uh, and it doesn't necessarily have to be uh, dumbed down, so to speak. They do pick up things and they understand. So that is that has been very encouraging to witness that. Yeah. And to your point, you said a moment ago, the myth is that, oh, kids only have a five to six minute attention span uh, and then they can't sit still. The reality is they do have short attention spans when they're younger, but they can learn to sit still. And often that means bringing some extra books for them to look at and some coloring pages and, you know, helping them learn to just sit there. Um, but nevertheless, they can grow and, and learn that. So... <laughs> Okay, thank you, kids. You're, You're welcome. welcome. No problem. <laughs> and now let's get back to Simonetta Carr. In a moment, we will hear from Simonetta about Lady Jane Grey. But first, we asked about a woman from Simonetta's own country, Julia Gonzaga. Julia Gonzaga lived in the 16th century in Italy while the Reformation was happening, and she had a very interesting story. She was a, a teenage widow. Yeah, her husband died when she was still a teenager, and she was very well taken care of by him. He passed his entire estate along to her. Julia was known to be very beautiful, and even at one point, pirates attempted to kidnap her. <laughs> But she stayed a widow, she didn't marry any pirate, that's for sure, and worked quietly for the Reformation in Italy, supporting many working in the Reformation all over Europe. It would have been safer for her to leave Italy, but she stayed in the Catholic Church and just under the radar of the clergy. Julia Gonzaga stayed in Italy and she was really trying. She, was, she kept hoping that the church would reform. From mm. the inside. So like, I that was, like Martin Luther and John Calvin when they began, too. Exactly. They, yes, initially. Mm -hmm. Exactly. She, yeah. And in Italy, so many people kept uh, nurturing those hopes because, like, when they, a pope changed, you know, maybe now, maybe now. And there was, um, uh, yeah, one time when one cardinal almost became pope and he was uh, leaning toward the Lutheranism. So, yeah, they had some hopes and they kept nurturing those hopes. So to me, this was also, there were two good things about this book that I, I want, could convey to the kids. One, she went through a lot of uh, time of questioning her own faith. And then she talked to Juan de Valdez, um, mm. who was a reformer. Yeah, a Spanish reformer. A Spanish one, yeah. Yeah. Another another country that was very difficult for yeah, the Reformation. Right, yeah. So it, I really like 
what he told her because she had all these doubts and questions and he went straight to the difference between law and grace. Boom. <laughs> so it's like, that's something that we don't talk so much about in most, in most children's books. I wanted to put something that the kids can, so that the kids can, can better understand some parts of their faith. And this was a way to, to really stress the difference between law and gospel. So she was not an easy person, like, oh, yes, anything you say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she kept uh, questioning, and he kept explaining, and, um, and he kept going back to that, to law and gospel. It's because she said, I go to church, and I hear these things, and all I can, I come out more discouraged than before. Mm. <laughs> so why am I going? <laughs> Wonderful. That's that it's because you're only hearing the law, you know. Because yeah. you, you have yeah. to preach the law and gospel. Don't don't get stuck there, you know. And, and then he was explaining what the law does for you and what the gospel does, you know. So the law can show your sins and it can show you pro the problem, <laughs> but then you really need to uh, lean on the gospel for the remedy. And uh, he has an amazing quote, but he said, "When God gave the law to Moses." The people of Israel who were at the foot of the mountain heard great thunder and lightning flashes, so they all trembled with fear. And everyone says this signifies the terror, fright, and inner conflict the law creates in the hearts of people who receive it. But you should also know, my lady, that the law is very necessary because without the law, there wouldn't be a conscience. And without a conscience, we wouldn't know our sin. And without knowing our sin, we wouldn't humble ourselves. And without humbling ourselves, we would not receive grace. And without grace, we would not be justified. And without justification, our souls would not be saved. Mm. This is the task of the law. At the same time, the gospel works in those who see it, not as law, but as messenger of grace and peace. It has the task of healing the wounds inflicted by the law, preaching grace, peace, and remissions of sins, calming and pacifying consciences, imparting the spirit that allows us to keep what the law shows about God's will, and to fight, conquer, and crush the enemy, the enemies of our souls. Mm. Wow. Amen. Beautiful. Beautiful quote. Yeah. It really is. And so Ju Julia, you know, as a, a woman who you know, had questions, mm -hmm. but she she's talking to Juan Valdez, uh, other reformers. She really seemed to embrace the heart of the Reformation, that right. we are saved by faith alone, yes. in Christ alone, through grace alone. Yes. And I like it. She really got there by questioning. It's not like, just like, okay, sounds good. <laughs> she, <laughs> she had a lot of questions. But once she understood that, she just went all out, you know, and then she uh, she is actually one that was responsible for um, the publishing of many, many, many essays and booklets in Italian, uh, including the benefit of Christ that I was talking about. She had a, a big network because she was an influential lady. Uh, but nobody knew, but they, they suspected, like uh, the, the Pope suspected her, but they couldn't, couldn't get her. <laughs> they couldn't get her. She was slippery. And didn't the Pope at that time, once he learned about her network, said, if I had known this, we would have yes. burned her at the stake. Right, right. Wow. Wow. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting story. Um uh, there's one more story that we're looking at in church history this month, especially since it's Women's History Month. Um, <laughs> the story of Lady Jane Grey. You have written about her as well. And she's yeah. a, another woman who, in the face of adversity, um, stayed true to Christ. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. what, what, are your, what are your thoughts about her that um, you wanted children particularly to know about? Mm. You know, it's it's interesting because I haven't picked up uh, her story in a while. But the thing that impressed me when I did uh, wrote her story, sometimes we focus on the last part of her story. How sure. you know she was uh, courageous at the end, and and that's true. But if you read her whole story, 
he was a typical teenager and <laughs> she was into clothes and she she, she was driving her tutors crazy you know, and like they were worried about her so um that encouraged me because i thought well she grew up in the faith and they were teaching her the, the gospel the bible you know, they they taught her right uh but you know she she was a teenager and then she found herself in a situation that was quite a challenge, you know, becoming the Queen of England all of a sudden. And then pretty much nine days later, you're arrested and, and uh, you're sentenced to death unless you renounce your faith. So it's, it's quite a, a challenge. I don't think any of our teenagers will, will go through. But what impressed me is that uh, what, what was inside of her, what she had learned, stayed. So at that moment, she, she could talk to her confessor to try to sway her. And, and she could talk very clearly and reasonably about the Bible and, and what she believed. And she had learned it as a, as a child. <laughs> and, so, and then also she stayed strong until the end. Her faith stayed strong. So it kind of encouraged me that she was not an unusual person in a way. She mm. was in a very unusual circumstances, but she was a normal young lady and, and she got saw it through. It's interesting you put it this way because I, I wrote a script a while back that we're going to use mm. for a podcast. And um, I never really actually put those things together. But, you know, she she threw herself on the floor mm. when she found out she was going to be made queen. I suppose it's a very human reaction, but it's yeah. also a very <laughs> teenager reaction. But mm -hmm. the way that she responded to having to face death and also having to face the challenge of her trying to be convinced of the Catholic faith to save her life um, and her her response to that, it's it's just incredible. And even even what she wrote in letters to, I believe it was her sister. Her sister. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, was just incredibly encouraging. You said what was inside yeah. of her. And so, right. so yeah. that's that's actually really encouraging for parents of teenagers. Yeah. Um, because they can act like teenagers, even when they are <laughs> saved, they act like teenagers. But, you know, there's immaturities there because we're still sinners. Yeah. So that's actually very encouraging to hear that connection yeah. of, yes, she was still a sinner. She still acted like a teenager. But when it Came, push came to shove mm -hmm. and she and her faith was um in question she she stuck to scripture she stuck to the bible she stuck to new what she knew of christ and those truths and that's mm -hmm. that's actually very encouraging yeah yeah the letter to her sister is in my book it's at the end of my book but her discussion with the, conf the confessor that they sent to talk to her uh, it's not but you can find it online mm -hmm. it that's quite amazing yeah. i don't know if i should give this away but that's what our that's what our uh, script is based on ah, good, good. stay tuned kids stay tuned <laughs> <laughs> yes. well simonetta it has been a pleasure to talk with you and to learn a little bit about how the lord has worked in your life as well as um, a couple of the ladies uh in church history who have inspired you um mm -hmm. a as we go here uh, is there a, a, a parting word that you can leave to the parents as well as the kids that are listening about the importance of studying church history together? Mm, there's so many uh, advantages of ch studying church history. And just to know that God has kept this church. You know? Amen. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I wrote this book. I don't know if you have seen it. It's just called Church History. Yes, very, it's a beautiful very book. Original. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, yeah, and so I start out with uh, what Jesus said, you know, I, I will build my church. And Amen. if so, hell will not prevail against it. But um, he made that promise. And then by the end of the book, I kind of look back and say, you know, did he keep that promise? And yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes Amen. <we're> here. <laughs> <laughs> and not only we are here, but it's like sometimes you say, oh, the church is dying. In, right. in my country. Yeah, look at the, all the other countries where it's just starting to, to blossom. It's like, mm -hmm. yep. you know, kind of we go through stages, but 
And, and you look throughout church history and the church went through so many trials and not just from the outside, from the inside too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then they sur- you know, the church survived. And what's really amazing, the gospel <laughs> survived. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for your time and, and for talking with us and, and our listeners here today. Thank you for having me. It was good to have you on. <laughs> I'm glad. This is the All Things Together podcast, and we're so thankful for the time we got to spend with Simonetta Carr. We really enjoyed talking with her and her sharing some of her unique knowledge about church history with us and our kids, as well as all of you out there in podcast listening land. (laughs) Yes, I do love her passion to share church history. And speaking of church history, don't forget to stick with us till the very end of our podcast to hear how you can win Simonetta Carr's church history book. Also, her Lady Jane Grey book and a prop from our John Knox movie. And speaking of John Knox, if you haven't seen that yet, we still have it on DVD as well as the digital download available for your purchase. It actually includes a curriculum for them to learn not just about John Knox, but about Calvin and Luther and Katie Luther. It's a lot of fun. Kid voices, adult actors, comedy, and they're just like the podcast theater we're about to hear, but a little more work. (laughs) A lot more work. (laughs) And with that said, it is now time for our podcast theater, and we have something really special, don't we? Yes, it's a brand new As Told by Littles podcast theater about Lady Jane Grey. So without further ado... Five Solas Media presents As Told by Littles podcast theater. Lady Jane Grey's Last Stand. (laughs) Wife, why are you weeping? It reminds me of the time you cried when your parents told you that you were to be my wife. (gasps) Oh, Edward has died? Me the queen? I don't know. Is this even legal? Imagine you're a teenager. Now, have you ever been annoyed by your parents? Like, for sure. Okay. Have your parents ever sold you to profit riches? Uh, no. They just ask me to clean my room all the time. Well, I'm talking about a 16th century kind of teen. The kind that is young, but well-educated, related to royalty, and mature. Like, what are you trying to say? Still hard to imagine? This describes Lady Jane Grey, who, just after entering into an arranged marriage for the profit of her parents, who were driven by money and riches. Oh, so they're trying to be real bougie, huh? Uh, sure. Anyways, despite her parents, God was gracious to save Jane and even give her a Christian mother figure in Catherine Parr, her great uncle Henry VIII's last wife. So just after the arranged marriage, Jane found out her life was about to change even more. King Edward VI, her cousin, had just changed his will a month before, saying that he wanted her to be queen. He was persuaded by powerful men who only had political gain in mind and didn't mind using a sick king and his unsuspecting young cousin to bring that about. And then Edward died. Let's see how she is handling the news. (laughs) Oh, me the queen? I don't know. Is this even legal? It's a bit sus if you ask me. Oh, it's just too much. I mean, I can't I can't even. I know this is a lot to take in, but Edward made sure he named you in his will. He desired for his heir to continue the Reformation. Mary Tudor wouldn't do that. And, uh, you can make me king. (sighs) You're right. I feel as though I should weep some more, but may God be glorified. And what is that I heard you say about being king? I don't have to make you king. You can be a duke, but not a king. What? Not make me king? I'm telling my mommy. (laughs) Lady Jane Grey wasn't too sure when asked to take the throne of England. After all, she was only a teenager, and it seemed those around her may be using her for their own gain. Oh, for real? Yeah. So, Jane, B, 
being a Protestant and a true believer in Christ, took the throne to help avoid Mary Tudor, who was a strong Catholic, from doing that herself. Mary Tudor became known as Bloody Mary to the Protestants. Ask your parents why later. Yeesh, yeah, that Mary Tudor, she had a weird vibe. Jane reigned for only nine days when she and her husband were arrested for treason against Mary Tudor, who believed she was the rightful heir to the throne. Mary basically got an army together of supporters, took the throne, and threw everyone in jail that had anything to do with putting Jane on the throne. While in jail, Jane waited, and waited, and waited. She got pretty lonely. Look. I know they will call me Bloody Mary in the history books, but I really didn't want to kill my cousin. If only she could convert back to the Catholic Church, then she could live. Just days before her execution, a man from the Catholic Church was sent by Queen Mary to visit Jane. Who's there? Someone to keep me company? Uh, sure, it's John Feckenham, and I am here to ask you if you finally will convert to the one true church. Oh, I'll gladly discuss my faith with you. I get really lonely in here, but I will say that I ground my faith upon God's word and not upon the church. But faith is not enough. As Paul wrote in Ephesians, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing, it is a gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. But you may find life in the church. Well then, I must ask you for a confession of conversion. I am trying to save your soul, your life. Okay, okay, don't lose your head over it. I'll write a confession for you. Here you are. I affirm that faith only saves but it is fitting for a Christian in demonstrating that he follows his master Christ to do good works. Yet may we not say that they save us, for when we have done all, we are only unprofitable servants, and faith only in Christ's blood will save us. Lady Jane, that's not a confession. You're gonna meet your death. As my Lord says in his word, For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Well, my dear Lady Jane, will you at least let me come with you to meet your death and your execution? Yes, kind sir, and I will pray that God, in the deepness of his mercy, will send you his Holy Spirit, for he has given you a great gift of tongue, if it pleased him also to open the eyes of your heart. Lady Jane Grey was executed on February 12th, 1554. Wait, what? She was only a teenager. Man, I'm shook. Yes, I know, but sometimes God shows himself mighty, even in parts of history that are hard to hear. And these stories we tell to encourage other Christians. Now where was I? Oh yes, Mary prepared for her execution by writing a letter to her sister, encouraging her in the Christian faith and stressing how important reading the Word of God is. The day of her execution, John Feckenham went with Jane and her ladies' maids to the scaffolding where she would be put to death. Ah, dear Jane, do you have any last words? Even though I am dying a true Christian woman, I am only saved by the mercy of God, the blood of His only Son, Jesus Christ. I confess, even though I knew what the Bible said, I ignored it. I loved myself in the world, and because of that, I am worthy of this punishment here today for my sins. But God in His goodness gave me time for respite to repent and to think on Him. While I am still alive, good people, please pray for me. It is a sobering thought that Jane, even with her death so close, at the age of 16 or 17, chose to tell what God had done in her life and ask fellow Christians for prayer while she was still alive. She referred to her time in jail as respite to repent, for time to reflect on the sin she came out of and her Savior Jesus Christ, who graciously saved her from it. May we seek God in the midst of trial. May we see trials as opportunities for respite to repent. Wow. 
That's actually an amazing story. Yes. Yes, it is. Soli Deo Gloria. This is the All Things Together podcast, and you just heard a brand new As Told by Littles podcast theater, Lady Jane Grey's Last Stand. Now, Lady Jane Grey wrote a letter to her 14-year-old sister just before she died. And she said something in it that I believe can apply to the kids listening today and the adults. Jane writes to her sister Catherine, Trust not that the tenderness of your age shall lengthen your life. For as soon, if God call, goeth the young as the old, and labor always to learn to die. Defy the world, deny the devil, and despise the flesh, and delight yourself only in the Lord. It seems Lady Jane Grey is echoing what was written in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers on example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Such encouragement for young believers. We hope you enjoyed the podcast theater. Thank you to our own kids, Jackson, who played the teenager and Lord Guildford, Madeline, who played Lady Jane Grey and Bloody Mary, Owen, who narrated, and our friend Alice, all the way up in Idaho, played John Feckenham. And we can't sign off this podcast without telling you about how to enter our giveaway. How do you enter, Troy? Well, our friends at Reformation Heritage have given us two books that Simonetta Carr has written. One on Lady Jane Grey, which is a beautiful book with some beautiful illustrations. And another one is a brand new one that just came out in the last year on church history. And that's really like a DK book with maps and timelines and really helpful insights into learning church history over the last 2,000 years. Yes, it's a beautiful book. It's definitely worth you entering. For details on how to enter, check out our show notes or visit fisolasmedia.com. Check out our blog page. We'll have details there as well. And if you'd like to follow us on Facebook or Instagram, look for Five Solas Films on Facebook and Five Solas Media on Instagram. We're actually pretty active on there and um, you get a lot of free information that you can share with your kids about church history. And, of course, you can find more details on how to enter the contest there. Well, we've come to the end of it. Thank you for listening, and thank you for your patience in getting this podcast out to you. It's the end of March, but we got it out this month, and we're looking forward to coming back in April with Professor Andy McIntosh about science and faith. And it's a lovely discussion that we have with this British man. Yes, I'm so excited to share that with you guys. We pray, as always, that these podcasts and uh, podcast theaters are a blessing to you. If they are, shoot us an email. Let us know. We'd love to hear from you. But for now, I'm Troy Lamberth. And I'm Melissa Lamberth. And this is All Things Together. together. I almost missed my cue. All Things Together is a production of Five Solas Media, a nonprofit production company.